All right. Um, we have been talking about what? Rotations. Good. Um, last time we derived, well, I guess we're the past several lectures, but we put everything together last time. So we said that rotation matrices must satisfy uh, orthogonality. is in Einstein notation. This one. Um, identity. Which in Einstein notation Found it last time. The one about the transpose? Yeah. A um, little bit more specific. Um, because you can have. You can have a, um, a matrix whose uh, inverse is its transverse, but in that case, the determinant will be plus or minus one. So we found an additional condition. The determinant, oh, I guess we can write it with a, just the vert vertical bars. Plus one. Right? So we talked about the sim simple transformation. And it was a rotation by 180 degrees and then a reflection. And you cannot do that in continuously, you know, with continuous rotations in uh, Euclidean space. So these ones are, are called proper transformations, the ones that have the determinant of one. Okay, so this is what we know. Actually, this is what we need from uh, transformation matrices. So, we have used um, the direction cosines. There were, how many, nine of them? Um, so they were the angles between uh, each of the axes and the rotated system. Um, then we did everything a little bit more abstractly and we had these um, elements. A, I, J, um, but we still, you know, kept talking about uh, a coordinate system that was independent, so that we can use uh, the Lagrangian formalism that you know we developed in the previous chapters. So, one such system uh, is we. Um, Euler's uh, angles or Euler parameters. So, 
So uh, we saw that one of the properties of rotation matrices is that since they are linear transformations, you can put a sequence of them and it's like the equivalent of uh, doing a single one that includes all of them, so the actual matrix multiplications. But we also saw that the that matrix multiplication doesn't commute. And so the order in which you apply transformations matters. So keeping that in mind, um, we're going to apply these three transformations. So I'm going to draw it over here, or I'll try to draw it. This is a right-hand system. So this is x, this is y, and this is z. And the three transformations that we're going to apply are B, C, and D. Mm. Are they in that order? Oh. Well, at least I got the middle one right. That is fine. So D is going to be this matrix. So what is this? We're looking at our uh, right-handed Cartesian system. This is a passive transformation, so we're changing the actual system, not a body, rigid body. direction. This will be y prime and z will remain the same. So this is also z prime. This angle over here is phi. This angle over here is phi. Good. So actually you can always um, align your rotation with one of the axes and so this one that we derive for this part that we derive for two dimensions, we can use it you know, more generally in three dimensions. Uh, the next one is going to be Super easy to see. Last chance. Okay, this is a good one. So this one is going to be
how does this one look like if we're going to apply it after the red rotation? Well, if this one is the uh, z-axis, what about this one? And we have two options, which one is going to be x or x prime? before D, it's going to be applied before D, isn't it? Uh, We're going to apply D, C, and then D. Actually, the way I'm drawing it, um, this one goes after the red one. So if it's going to be after the red one, which x-axis is it? The red one, the prime one. Okay, so, uh, and it's going to be along x, so actually this is going to be you know, like this. So x is going to stay the same. Let's call it x. Uh, wait, uh, yeah, it's fine. And then this one, it's difficult to draw, but you know, it's going to be like this, and it will be this angle. Um, I guess it's this angle. And this one is also going to be rotated like this. This is going to be Z double prime and Y double prime. Okay, and last one is going to be, let's see how good this one is. Right, well, we know uh, D and C, so this one is easier to guess. It's going to be a rotation about Z prime prime, and it looks like the other one. So, I guess this is even more difficult to draw, but it's like this. Um, So this angle is psi. This one stays the same. All right, so we apply three successive uh, transformations and that gives us A. So Phi, theta, and psi are independent. So uh, we can use them as uh, coordinates for the Lagrangian formalism. These three angles are called the uh, Euler angles. So, I mean, this is difficult to draw, but it's not difficult to imagine. So I'm going to get rid of it.
Yeah, you're right. I don't want to get confused. It is BCD. Okay. So it's not. We know that uh, matrix multiplication doesn't commute, but it is associative. So we can uh, first do the CD multiplication and. CD is going to look like this. And A, which is the whole thing, it's going to be, oh, this one is really long, as you might imagine. But let's see the structure is uh, cosine psi phi mm, okay you will often find Uh, shorthand notation. So this is cosine psi cosine phi sine psi cosine theta sine phi. This is one term Tiny one. So what is special about that transformation matrix? It's long. Usually something this long, you'll think it's ugly and hence unworthy of physics.
Have you seen a, a matrix like this one before? Never? No. Have you um, looked at my applied problem for today? What is it today? Uh, they have that structure? Do they have that structure, the matrices? Yeah. I mean, this one is kind of unnecessary. You can just use you know this one, say, because it has a um, has cubic symmetry. So it doesn't matter if you look at the x-axis, x-axis, x, y, or z. It's going to be the same. So you can limit yourself to the two-dimensional ones. But this is a general form. Um, there are some issues, I guess, well, they're necessary. Um, you know, we have things that are not really physical laws, but they are conventions and everybody uses them. For example, the right side is positive or up is positive, um, you know, there's Nothing in the universe that tells you that that should be the case. Um, but pretty much everybody does that. You have uh, right-handed systems, right? Which, um, in which the angle between X and Y will give you the positive Z. And that's usually the system that people use. But you could use uh, left-handed systems. And in that case, you have um, X and Y, and so down will be the positive, right? So you have uh, two conventions, both are used, one much more than the other. What about here? What will be the convention? The convention is the way you, um, the order in which you apply the transformations. So we applied one in particular. Um, how many are there? The only rule is that two successive transformations uh, cannot be uh, about the same axis because you know, then they might cancel out um, and you will not get three independent coordinates. You will get two, which is not enough to describe everything. So there are two. Mm, three. Three different convexes. More. There's three for the first matrix, and then the other two. Nine. Mm, how do you get to nine? Well, so you apply. You up like. First you get the angle phi, mm -hmm. then theta, and then psi. Oh, okay. And they are with respect to different axes. The only rule is that you don't, you don't do the same axis in a row. So you have three for the first one, for phi. How many for theta? Two, because you cannot do the same axis. And for psi? Two. You kind of do the same axis again, but remember that each time um, it's about the rotated system. So actually, there's only one that shares, you know, one axis that is shared between rotations. It's the one that you cannot use. Like when the x prime and x double prime were on the same. Mm -hmm. So 12, right? 3 times 2 times 2. So, you know, definitely more options than you know, left and right, the other way around, left and right. Um, and different communities, I guess, use different conventions. So this one, the one that I showed over here, is called um, X convention.
is the one that is used uh, pretty much exclusively in uh, celestial mechanics. So um, we did first the rotation about the z-axis and then about the x prime axis and then about the z prime prime axis. So the first one was with the angle phi and just call it R for rotation. I guess I should call it A for consistency. This is a rotation matrix, so. And it was a function. I guess we can put like a Z over there to remind us. And this was about, this, this produced the angle phi. So in celestial mechanics, this one is called the precession. The second one is about x, and it produces the angle theta. The other one is called the nutation. And the third one produces psi. That one is called the spin. And well, the, the book calls it X convention because of because you use the X in the middle. But you know, if you're going to talk to someone who actually uses this all the time, I don't know, maybe someone at an airport, uh, they're going to call it three three one three. Right, so Z, X, Z. Um, so just thinking about celestial mechanics, do this make sense? What do they represent? Well, this first one, let's say that you have the sun over here and you have something rotating. Uh, this phi is going to be this angle. Right, like around the x-axis. Uh, this one is the, it's like a rocking motion. It is produced by, you know, all the other planets that are uh, pulling on the planet, in, um, let's say the Earth, in a pretty much chaotic way. Um, it is also produced by you know, the oceans, um, by the moon, so you're gonna have this rocking motion, and then the spin is just you know the this rotation. The other convention that the book talks about is the Y convention, and this will be the same actually, um, but you will have. I guess um, well, I'm going to use this one. Because uh, this one will be, well, I'm going to put them vertical. This one will be Y. Uh, theta and z psi. So you you will still call these the precession, the nutation, and the spin. It's just the nutation is described by a different axis. Um, so this one is the one that is uh, commonly used in quantum mechanics. So when you look at you know the spin of the electron and all that stuff, um, Pauli matrices. Um, um, spinners and all that stuff will be with the Y convention. And there's another one that is used by uh, 
aircraft and this one will be three 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 two three. The other one is called um, XYZ. Well, this is how the book calls it anyways. More commonly known as 321. This one, the, it's a rotation about the X axis, and then the Y prime axis and then the Z double prime axis. So this one, each rotation is on a different axis. Uh, well, I guess in the other ones too, but um, the X and the Y convention have the, some of the angles sometimes become um, very small. And so, if you are doing precision stuff, like for example, you want to land something on Mars, um, it'll be, it's dangerous. So they use this one. Um, this is the rotation, well, sorry, A, on phi, and it's known as the roll. This one is the one on phi, it's known as uh, beta. It's known as the pitch, and the last one is known as the yaw. And I think normally um, they give the yaw first, it will be yaw, pitch, roll. Um, the order matters. So this convention is, is really um, follow strictly because, you know, it's a difference between crashing or not. So if you follow this convention, these angles are called the Tate um, Bryan angles. But, you know, they're really just the order angles. If you have um, a plane, to be in that direction. How can you do straight lines? It looks something like that. going to be the x-axis of the plane. So this is going to be, this is the roll. And then uh, the y-axis is in this direction. It's right-handed. So this rotation is the pitch. And finally, we have a z-axis over here. This one is the yaw. Okay, so well, this is kind of small. So roll. Uh, this one. Uh, the the pitch is like this, right? And the yaw is like this. So ideally, you want all those angles to be zero if you're flying, I suppose. So. You're going to end up with a matrix that is not the same as this one, but it comes from the same place. It's just applying the, um, the rotations in a conventional order. 
Okay. So, we know that, well, we have these, these conditions over here. We have seen that the orientation of anybody can be described by A, by some rotation matrix. If at the beginning of time, t equals zero, the space and the body axis are aligned, then Anybody has done celestial dynamics work? No? Uh, this one is the, this is not an angle anymore. We're gonna talk about DRM. For rigid body. So you have this is the uh, space. Uh, system, your body is going to be rotating, you know, whatever, doing its thing. But at the beginning, at least, you can align the two axes. So, A of zero, I guess, well, this is a function of the time. Um, these transformations with time are going to be continuous, so you should be able to differentiate them. But at zero, they're just um, the identity matrix. Right, so x is equal to x, y is, uh, y is equal to y, z is equal to z. And so the theorem says that The general displacements a general displacement will include if you're using um, Euler's angles will include all three uh, coordinates in general so the general displacements of a rigid body with one point fixed. Is a rotation about some axis. Okay, so this one it's an interesting one. So we have this system and we are going to rotate the red one, which is the, um, the body uh, system. About a point. And this point could be anywhere. So let's say that um, it's over here. Then how will this uh, body system rotate? Well, it's gonna, it's gonna come out, right, like this. 
and it's going to be on this other side. So what does it look like? This will have like our x-axis over here. Um, the z-axis will still be over here, which means that Y would be over here. Is that right? Well, in any case, um, I don't know if uh, my brain can rotate things anymore, but that is the idea. Looks weird. So, that one is X? This one. Which one? Oh, in, without rotating? That is X? X, Y, and Z. Okay. And we are rotating. And we're rotating about this point. Okay, so. Uh, I think it's correct. <laughs> This is, um, you know, good stuff. Like when you're taking a shower or something, you have nothing better to do. <laughs> Train your brain. Um, so this is a fixed point, okay? General displacement means that we're going to we general rotate the whole um, Cartesian system. It's a rigid body, so it's still describing a rigid body. And what the theorem says is that any displacement can be defined as a rotation about a fixed point. You know, I'll say maybe you know, if I if I don't see anything else. So um, we have uh, some examples that I thought of. Not very good examples. But... So if you have like the sun over here and the earth over here and you know, the earth is rotating around the sun, um, what will be this um, axis and the, and, and the, the fixed uh, point? Mm, like this? It is rotating like this, the Earth. The wire is... Z. Right? So it's going to rotate about this point. The wire points are... Yeah, but it's, it's a rotation, remember. So... Uh, let's see if we can... So there's a fixed point over here. This is the axis about um, which the Earth is rotating, and you know it is moving like this. So this is the one that is rotating. Uh, the other so, one. I is the rotation in the y axis. I is the rotation. Yeah, I get that of z. I get that of x. Mm, in general, or which? Or if it's in the x-axis, it's moving this way. Is that right? Why don't you show us? <laughs> okay, so if it's in the x-axis, it's like moving like this. Is that? You are rotating it. This way. You're rotating the whole thing, the red one, mm -hmm. about this point. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, you know, this one is going to move like this, right? and it's going to go back into the board. So, the but if it's in the z direction, it's going to move. Then. If it's in the it's like you put it you know, over here and then you just move it like this. 
Exactly. So if it's here, yeah, if it's in the water, I use a gun. Uh, like this. You, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But it is, that is not the case here. Yeah. That's why I was confused. <laughs> um, my other example was um, like how do you call this one? It's not a, is it a merry go round? Yeah, right. The carousel is the one that is like this, with like the horses over here, and this one is a merry go round. So this one, the fixed point is going to be the center. Then you have like the cards over here, right? So you're taking it about this fixed point. So um, there's only one point. So now let's see if we can It is always possible to find an axis through the fixed point with orientation in polar angles. These are the polar angles, not the Euler's, uh, the Euler angles, theta and phi, such that a rotation by psi, psi is the, the actual rotation, duplicates the general rotation. So what this is saying is, we can apply our three um, transformations. You're gonna have you know, some angle phi, some angle theta, some angle psi, and you're going to end up somewhere. What this theorem says is that you can find an axis, a vector, uh, through the fixed point such that you only need a rotation of this vector. Which is a, an interesting idea. Um, I think it's, it's kind of easy to see if you draw it. So what I was doing is, um, I'll put it over here. I'm gonna put it over here. We have burn this in our eyes. You probably see this when you close your eyes, right? Burn your retinas. So this is a system. It is rotating about this axis. And you know, I drew my little uh, vector in here and you rotate this one axis you know let's say I don't know close to 180 degrees and so this one is going to move to this other side right it's going to look like that if you instead have the same system. This is the axis of rotation. If you put your vector in here, 
but it looks like this. And you rotate it and say close to 180 degrees. Then you're going to end up with this vector. All right, which is not quite the same. But there's one vector, actually only one vector. Um, well, the direction, the magnitude can be different. But you have your axis here. And this vector, if you rotate it, doesn't change. So what the theorem says is that you can find this vector. So if that is the case, you know, we will write this as um, rotation prime is equal to our rotation matrix with the Euler angles times the vector r. And this is equal to just r. And this is actually the case that we care about. But more generally, this is going to be equal to lambda r. Or lambda is just it's going to be the magnitude of this vector. So you know, it can be really big and still um, the direction is the same. So the magnitude um, is going to be 1 because this is a, um, a rotation, a transformation matrix. Um, but in the general equation, it can, be, it can have any magnitude. So uh, lambda is potentially complex. Mm. But the condition that we wanted, and it was one of is what it was the one that we determined last time is that the uh, the determinant should be one so lambda will have to be one uh, rotation matrices are real so this one is real and yeah so then we can restate um, Euler's theorem in terms of these uh, vector. So it will be restatement once we know that. The real orthogonal matrix specifying how do spell it? The physical motion of a rigid body with one point fixed always has eigenvalue 1. It's given by that equation. So if we expand in this equation, it will look like this. A11 minus lambda. Big X uh, plus A one two Y plus A one three Z equals zero. A two one X plus A two two minus lambda Y 
plus a to three z zero and finally three one x three two y and a three three minus lambda z equals zero. So we have this system of equation of equations. Uh, we can determine the ratios between the components, uh, but you know, because this is equal to zero, you can multiply by any number and still get this equal to zero. So the magnitude is not um, it's not defined here, but the the direction is it's this direction. So because you can multiply by anything, the number of solutions is what is the number of solutions? Three. You can multiply those three solutions that you found by any number. Hmm? What is n? Mm -hmm. So if it's a linear combination, how many will you have? Well, your intuition is failing you. I guess three is a good guess. Um, things can be zero, one, or what's the other one? Zero first. Okay, everything in physics and math is either zero, one, or infinity. So this one is infinity. You can find um, a set of, of numbers that satisfies these equations, but then you can just multiply it times two, and it still satisfies the equations because this is just one times zero. Well, zero times two still satisfies. Where you multiply it by you know, four or 25, uh, actually by the infinite numbers of, of numbers, infinite number of numbers. So um, this is infinite. So if the number of solutions of a matrix is infinite, the matrix is uh, singular. So a singular matrix has either zero solutions or an infinite number of solutions. And the determinant determinant of such matrix is what? Zero. Zero. Good. All right, so then you will You know, the way I try to remember things is by uh, remembering one thing and then like applying operations. That decreases the number of bytes, I guess. Um, I want to check the, the cross product. It is identical to the determinant. I had a, a bit shifting things there and it was wrong. I don't know why I remember that. So this one is going to look, uh, where is it?
going to be uh, a11 minus lambda, a12, a13, a14, a15, a16, and a17. Okay, and minus lambda. Determinant of this, um, well, we know what it is. So it's going to be it's going to be a one one minus lambda, and then this stuff. Just going to uh, put it like that. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I'm going to call it star um, minus. A12, and then we have, um, how do you guys call this one? Um, you young folks? <laughs> Pound. <laughs> um, and A13, um, what other symbol can I use? At. So, how do we call this equation? Right. So, this is the secular or characteristic. Characteristic. Um, polynomial right so um, this one is going to have uh, this asterisk right it has this multiplication so it has a lambda square and you have this lambda over here so you're going to have a polynomial of degree 3 which you know, is what you get when you have um, when you're in three-dimensional space. So if you have a polynomial of degree three, how many roots are you going to have? Three. Three. So um, this we know that one of the eigenvalues has to be plus one. Um, we don't really know about the other two, but um, yeah. the algebra is kind of neat, but I don't have time to write everything. So um, you're going to end up with a term. You can look at my notes when I upload them. So you're going to have a minus lambda um, cubed, and then lambda squared. Minus lambda. So you're going to have a bunch of stuff over here. This one is long. And then you're going to have um, and even longer here with three terms. So it's going to be a11, a22, a33, a11, a23, a32, and so on. This whole thing is equal to zero. Um, the algebra is kind of nice because uh, this whole term over here. Um, that has no, is not multiplied by lambda. It's actually the determinant of R without that lambda. And then this one over here, they're going to have permutations um, of these matrices. So you're going to have uh, an A, um, well, it's going to be A11. Um, plus a to two plus 
833. So when you put everything together, you end up with this equation, uh, secular or characteristic. So if you um, factorize this one, you're going to end up with something like this, and then other stuff over here. So you recover your, uh, the eigenvalue that you care about. Um, so just very quickly, I wanted to mention that this is not the only way you know, with the transformation matrices, it's not the only way of describing rotations. And in fact, it's not even the, the, more efficient, the most efficient. Mm. This will give you a pretty good idea of how to describe a rotation. You need a vector and you need an angle. Um, is there such a thing? Something that will include both um, a scalar, an angle, and a vector? Yeah, they were invented, actually, they were invented I guess Euler didn't notice it, but Euler came up with the first example. And uh, they're called uh, quaternions. So quaternions um, are a generalization of complex numbers. So uh, typically, you're going to use Q. Um, it's represented as Q0. Q1, Q2, and Q3. So it's Q0 plus Q1i plus Q2j plus Q3k. to call this one, I guess just Q. So these I, J, and K, they are not normal uh, vectors. They're called um, basic quaternions. But you know, they have the same role as like the unit vector. And the way in which they are uh, added, well, I guess addition is the same as um, vector, but the multiplication uh, is weird. And this one, the vector multiplication, gives you, I don't remember what the components are in here, but it gives you a dot product, let's say Q1 and Q2, so probably not the right ones. Um, and then you have a, well, this is a scalar, and then you have a dot product, I mean a cross product. And then um, for the scalar multiplication over here, um, this is a regular one. It's gonna be, I don't know, we don't put it as Q0, Q0. So you end up with your, still with your scalar and with your vector. So 
this seems complicated, but you know, once you write your, your code, you don't have to worry about it. The, um, the approach with Euler's um, angles has problems uh, because sometimes uh, you can have, it's like having you know, three circles, right? Um, the other one is this. So you can have a situation in which two of them are aligned and then you don't know exactly what's going on. Your solutions are, um, how do you say it, um, hard to generate. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't happen with the quaternions. So what the quaternions do is go to four dimensional space and do the rotations in four dimensional space. And the, the quaternions can be represented as, well, the, the three rotations the, uh, with the rotation matrices. What is going? This is phi. You divide by two, but I'm just gonna put the phi. Uh, zero, zero. This is sine of phi. This will be equivalent to your uh, B, right, for example, depending on the order in which you have it. Um, this one's gonna be cosine of theta, sine of theta, and the third one is going to look like this. Cosine five, sine five, zero, zero. So this will be A in quaternions. So this one is your um, your scalar part, and this is the vector part. And if you um, multiply everything, but with the cues, the rotation matrix, you know, just like the very long one that I uh, wrote at the beginning, going to be Q0 square, Q1, oh, there's an AP, yes. Q3 square, 4 squared, Q1, Q2, Q0, Q3, Q0, Q2, Q1, Q3. The point here is that these um, pattern, we're just adding everything, is going to be in the diagonals. And over here, the negatives switch and the off diagonal you have uh, this other kind of pattern with the two and then the two components of the quaternion that multiply and um, like that. so um, I thought that chapter section 4.5 was less elegant than it should have been. So if you compare this one to equation 4.47, you'll see that they're almost identical. So in general, quaternions are used instead of uh, Euler angles. Uh, your cell phone decides or finds 
its orientation in space using quaternions. So I think that's kind of cool. So in the case of Euler angles, we all have three angles, right? Mm -hmm. And then in quaternions, home? it's one vector and one angle, which is Euler's theorem. Then Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3 are. Well, uh, what I mean to solve the. There are the components over here, mm -hmm. but. There are uh, particular multiplication rules. So you have to look at, at the details to see what the square means. They're not, they're not regular vectors. Um, but you know, a computer doesn't care what the rules are. You just type it in. Um, so this is used uh, extensively uh, in computer graphics too. So all computer graphics, you know, like when you, like all the rotations are quaternions. So video games, uh, movies, um, you know, all that good stuff is this. Um, I guess you can use it, well, I mean, it is used in physics also. Um, for um, like crystals when you're rotating them. Um, and it has, I guess, some more fundamental um, importance because this is a type of algebra, right? So um, different algebras describe different uh, phenomena, right? Like, for example, um, elementary particles and the spins that they could have, they, could, they all come from, from the algebras that describe them. So. Yeah, this is a, the generalization of uh, complex numbers. All right, let's go. So those quaternions, they look like you have um, the pile it looks like the new Kursky space, like you have time in spatial. Just when I see that, it looks like... You can probably use them to describe something like that. I mean, they're, they're used widely. They're just like, you know, like complex numbers. Uh, where you have like the sine and the cosine, uh, the I, uh, uh, I sine. But it's a generalization of that. So that one is in two, in two dimensions, it's in four dimensions. Yeah. So when I see Q naught as time and then the rest as spatial mm -hmm. space time. So, I mean, it looks like I'm in the pattern. And then mm, so I believe that in the 90s or so, someone, um, uh, I guess, re, I don't know how to call it, Reformat it. <laughs> okay. Um, Einstein's general relativity in terms of the quaternions. Oh. oh so yes, really? I mean. I didn't check. I just by looking at it, mm -hmm. it looks like like that. Yeah, you have good intuition. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and on the exam, I just saw it yesterday. You wrote like the color of the paper reminds you of financial times. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> because was, um, I usually like snap it, like scan it, and it's like a small effort, not, not the big one, 
and then yeah it looks like because it looks like old and <laughs> it looks like pink What's yeah that? i saw the wikipedia it was the wikipedia um link that you said and i was laughing when i saw <laughs> Yeah, that's like, oh, very, very elegant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, he's killing marker.